reality doesn't follow accounting. We cannot structure something for an accounting objective. But anyway, let's leave that at that. Then we have another issue. And this issue still vexes us to, till today. We don't have an answer. If you have an answer to this next question, speak to me afterwards. Here's the issue. In our Gulf countries and China, government owns shares in lots of corporate entities. Government owns shares in the airline, they own shares in the power company, they own shares everywhere. Government gives a grant to the company, gives them assets. The question that we're asking is, listen, is this a government grant or is this a shareholder contribution? Now, as a good auditor, what you'd say, let's look at documentation. Guess what? There isn't any. The reality is, how do you decide whether something is a government grant or it's a shareholder contribution? We look at the definitions, we are exhausted by the definitions. The accounting consequences are severely diverse. <laughs> if I'm saying it's a government grant, I debit the asset and credit income statement. If I say it's a shareholder contribution, I debit the grant and I credit equity. Till today we are struggling. We sit with our other colleagues over the other firms and we're trying to find principle to be able to determine this. Now, what we're saying is this is an anomaly. Good old IS-20 is an old standard that probably didn't contemplate these issues. It excludes from its scope equity transactions or if government is your shareholder. But when is something a government grant and when is it a shareholder contribution? Complicated issue. Let's, if you've got an answer, speak to me afterwards. Sharia-based products. Lovely, lovely topic here. People are, there are lots of Sharia-based products in the Gulf. There are lots of Sharia-based products here. People ask me, how do you account for that under IFRS? And I give them the IFRS answer. Now, the reality of the IFRS answer means that if there is a loan, it will accrue interest. That doesn't make the product non-Sharia compliant. Remember that. IFRS is measuring the economics on another basis. The Sharia compliance, whether a product is Sharia compliant or not, IFRS doesn't tell me that. That Sharia compliance must be decided by somebody who has Sharia knowledge. IFRS will tell me how to account for things. You know what I, what I would not like to have is you have two different universes. You have Sharia reporting and non-Sharia reporting and IFRS reporting. You know what you could, would get banks doing? Conventional banks would structure products, call it an Arabic name, sell it to anybody to get an accounting objective. You'll get accounting arbitrage if you have two parallel universes. And that's what is happening to some degree on AOV. You know, you've got a bank with two arms. They launch a product through their Islamic arm because they want a specified accounting treatment. But you know what? That product is sold to anybody. Let me explain to you how Sharia transactions work. I'll just give you very, very briefly on this. Sharia transactions for IFRS purposes must be evaluated on an IFRS basis. I'll give you an example. I had a sh there's a sh there was a transaction which was supposed to be structured as an IJARA transaction. They wanted to achieve operating lease accounting. They leased a motor vehicle for three years. The Sharia scholar signs off that that is an IJARA contract. Also with the product, there was an option to acquire that motor vehicle at the end of three years at one dollar. Under Sharia principles, they're saying there are two separate contracts. There's a contract for an operating lease and there's a contract for the option. Because there is optionality, no problem, this is an operating lease. From an IFRS perspective, we'll say, hey, wait a minute. Will you buy a three-year-old car for one dollar? Yes, I will. I definitely will buy a three-year-old car for one dollar. In fact, I can even take out the brake pairs and sell it. In the scrapyard, I'll get more than one dollar. So what IFRS will say is, wait a minute, the person, the customer on the other side is entering into this contract together. He's only giving, taking the option of one dollar with the, with the lease contract. Therefore, the economic substance of this transaction 
is a transfer of ownership. And that's the reality. We have the same answers with Mudarabha, We look at economic substance. I'm not saying whether the product is Sharia compliant or not. I can't make that call. I'm not qualified. I'm a chartered accountant, not a Sharia scholar. That the Sharia scholar has signed off on it, good. I'm just giving you the economic substance. And it can't differ. Sukuk is another example. How does Sukuk work? Goodness gracious, if you look at Sukuk, the way the Sukuks are structured, Sukuk is a bond. If the investor has this bond, let's say he pays 100 and the Sukuk gives him exposure to property, in theory, for it to be Sharia compliant, he has to have unlimited upside and unlimited downside. However, when you read the terms of the Sukuk, it gives you limited downside. Which means that you can take the Sukuk certificate and give it back and get your 100. So this is how it would work. You buy a Sukuk for 100, they invest in property in the background. If the property value goes to 500, you get 500. If the property value goes to 30 or 20, what you do? Just give your certificate back and get the 100. <laughs> because they give you capital protection. Now whether that's Sharia compliant or not, I can't say. But I'm telling you that behaves a lot like a bond. <laughs> and the person who's issuing the Sukuk has to stand ready with 100. He's got a liability which is payable on demand of 100 at any given point in time. So, and what's the, what does the liability, if, it's a, if the liability is only settleable in a few years time, it gives rise to interest. And that's realities we face. We have lots of arguments with serious scholars. Um, and, but what I'm saying is IFRS is based on reality. Let's carry on. Another problem we have, or errors we observe in application of IFRS, is treatment of an end of service benefit. Now I believe you have a similar kind of gratuity scheme here in the region, where you're paying somebody a gratuity based on his final year of service salary multiplied by the number of years of service he's provided to date. You know what? That's an actuarial benefit. How people currently calculate this benefit in the Gulf is, you know what? The, this is how much years the guy has worked so far. This is what his salary is as if they're going to liquidate tomorrow. We accept it because they are over providing. And you know what? We don't have actuarial expertise to give us the correct number. In Pakistan, there is exp actuarial expertise. There's a wealth of that. So you've got to use that and calculate that correctly. Another problem we have is director's fees recognized in equity. In a lot of the Arabic law, they say director's fees should be go into equity. Now this to me is nonsense. We need to change the law. And we are speaking to the, the regulators at the moment. Why are you paying directors? Because they are working for the company. Even though the shareholder appoints them, the shareholder is not receiving services directly. The only way the director benefits the shareholder is through the company. The director is not a shareholder. The only thing that goes through equity, capital contributions and dividends, and all the other items of OCI. But director's fees cannot go through equity. It can't. It shouldn't. It is not a distribution of a, the shareholder. In that case, whatever decision or appointment the directors make should go through equity. Directors appoint auditors, therefore audit fees should go through equity. We can't apply the dumb logic. If we are looking at what is the company benefiting. Later on, we're going to speak about current versus non-current classification of debt. Then there's this topic of offsetting. <laughs> and this has come up in our Pakistan context here. We're talking of a matter of circular debt. Where you owe him, he owes you. You owe him, he owes you. They, everybody owes everyone money here. Question. That I, the IFRS question that comes about. Can you set off? IFRS rule for set off is simple. You set off if there is a legal right of set off and you intend to settle. If there is no legal right of set off, you can't set off. You can't. You can't do that. Sorry, people. If there are three parties involved, IS 32 has a paragraph that says, wait a minute, if there's a third party involved with some government organization at the end, it must be a tripartite agreement for you to achieve set-off. 
if there's only two angles or two sides of the triangle